Hey guys, so this is a story we've done on Neckbeardia. However, with that channel being condemned by YouTube, we are slowly but surely moving all of our voiceover videos to this channel, leaving only text -to speech videos public on our old channel. We're sorry about all this hassle, but we're sure you guys know how difficult it can be to keep up with YouTube's terms of service. Uh, but the links are down below for a video explaining the situation if you want to learn more, but let's get into the video. All right. I'm not sure how interesting the story is, but I'll go ahead and tell it. The core of the party in my longest running D&D is a necromancer. Now, one of the first things he did was obtain the Find Familiar spell. He may actually have started with that spell and just needed to get the 11 secret herbs and spices necessary to cast it. I don't remember. He tossed the herbs on the brazier, chanted the words of mystic power. The player rolled on the table and out trundled a small, disgusting rat. He couldn't have been happier. The wizard named him Marty. It's Grand Wizard. <laughs> now, going in, he didn't really know much about how to take care of rats, but he knew that they were supposed to like cheese. So he made a point to get a hold of cheese wherever he went and share it with his beloved Marty. This necromancer developed an interest in cooking in a rather roundabout way. You see, he had the autonomy proficiency, and in fact, he had the autonomous kit from the complete book of necromancers. In order to make a small amount of extra money, keep his skills sharp, and learn about the autonomies of different animals, he began working as a butcher from time to time. It also helped explain his need for blood-stained aprons, and assortment of extremely sharp knives. It had the added benefit of giving him a way to dispose of excess monster body parts. That is, those he didn't preserve for future study and use. Well, before long, this necromancer had a bit of business going, but the truth was, Although he greatly enjoyed the process of butchery, which wasn't really proper butchery the way he did it, it was more of a dissection. And using his herbalism and maybe a couple of other proficiencies, he later picked up the cooking proficiency and collected recipes from across the world in his adventures. He simply wasn't all that inspired by meat. Cheese, on the other hand, was a subject of great interest to him. He enjoyed it considerably. And over the years, he and Marty became accomplished cheese connoisseurs. They had sampled cheeses from all over the land, and they became very adept at judging them. So much so that they could have worked as a professional cheesemonger in a large city, had they been so inclined, and had they not been so creepy and disgusting. In time, he learned to make cheese of his own. He invested some of the loot that he had acquired in his adventures in some sheep and goats and later some cattle as well. He is currently trying to acquire some buffalo and other, even more exotic creatures, and set up a cheese-making operation. Now, being a necromancer, he had certain advantages that mundane cheesemakers do not. Undead are a rather poor choice of herders, but they can be used to protect herds from bandits and predators. And while a goat will not allow itself to be milked by a skeleton, skeletons able to perform many of the menial tasks of cheese production. Now, cheese making requires a large amount of milk, and if you want to do it well, a good deal of specialised equipment and unusual substances, rennet, acid and the like. As I indicated, he took care of these with the small fortune he had accumulated through his adventures. It also required a good deal of labour. This need he satisfied through a combination of employing locals and, quietly, providing his own corpse of loyal workers. But he still needed a good place to age the cheese. Fortunately, he was able to come up with just the place. Early in his adventuring career, he had cleared out a number of caves, ruins and catacombs, and had always meant to go back and make sure they had not become bandit dens or some such. Anyway, so it was that he set out about returning to the nearby dungeons he had cleared in the past and repurposing them for cheese production. He cleaned them, rebuilt when necessary, fortified them against potential attacks, populated them with undead servitors, and proceeded to fill them with curds to age. So here we have a rather sinister, certainly deranged man constructing fortified, undead infested underground lairs, just as any villain would. But instead of doing so for the purpose of terrorizing the countryside, worshiping dark god, or hatching fell schemes, he was trying to establish a higher standard of cheese for the region and provide quality snacks for his best friend. He was a rap. All right. So he's got this cheese making operation. The thing about this necromancer though, is that he's not very patient. He's a hard worker and is willing to devote literally insane amounts of time and effort to really odd and kind of pointless things. But he doesn't like idly waiting. 
and the production of cheese, partially high quality hard cheese, requires a lot of waiting. However, he heard a rumour that the master cheesemakers of the halfling race possessed magics that would allow them to do it in weeks or months, what would ordinarily take years. These rumours were true. It's an actual magic item published in an obscure section of a moderately unpopular book that TSR actually put out. So it was that this master of the black arts set out for the great shire that was considered the homeland of the halfling culture to learn the secrets of the master halfling agriculturists and food artisans. Now, it turns out that rural halflings are disinclined to trust weird, overtly creepy tall folk wizards who carry around filthy, repulsive sewer rats, much less turn over their revered family recipes hard-won trade secrets and cherished magics to them. In time though, through a combination of heroic good deeds, genuinely endearing, if often inept, kindness and good manners, and the gift of large quantities of quality pipeweed, he was able to win the friendships of the bulk of the halfling community and learn much of the secrets he sought and many others. Besides, what he could not win by friendship, he stole by guile or seized by force. Secretly, of course. Armed with this precious knowledge inscribed into his intermixed journals, sketches, notes and spell formula, he returned to his homeland and found that, after little profit in the first few years, since, as explained, it takes years for the quality cheeses to age, his business had developed a reputation for quality, largely on its own merits, but greatly accelerated by this necromancer's existing friendship with respected cheesemongers in the big cities of the setting and was now turning a tidy profit. The magics he brought with him allowed him to greatly expand his operation, producing large quantities of relatively inexpensive but high quality cheeses that formed the bulk of his trade, continuing the production of short ripening cheeses as usual, but completely eliminating the normal production of mid-term ripening cheeses in his dungeon. I've never said cheese so much (laughs) in my life. (laughs) Instead, using the halfling magic to produce them at a greatly accelerated rate, his cheese catacombs were reserved for the ripening of his premium line of cheeses. Now by this point, he'd reached a pretty high level and it was high time for him to build his stronghold. I figured he'd construct a wizard tower or some such in cheese country, but he had other ideas. For this next bit to make sense, there are a couple of other things you need to understand about this character. First of all, as an adjunct to his alchemical studies, which was yet another interest of his. He had naturally become acquainted with the technology of distillation. This eventually led him to develop skills at the more general art of brewing, simply so he could have another practical application for his knowledge, making brandies and strong spirits and such. He had helped found a couple of small-scale breweries, wineries and distilleries. In fact, one of his dungeons was used to age liquor rather than ripen cheese. His products The ones that had by then seen market, some he was still waiting on a lot of them, were of high quality, simply because he held them to the same high standards to which he held all of his endeavours, and were relatively well regarded, but had nowhere near the scale of production the cheese had. This changed somewhat when he put the brewers in contact with a tribe of orcs, whose culture he and the party fighter had ruined, which is something I can tell you about if you wish. In an effort to improve the lot of this orc tribe, he gave them access to a number of resources, which included both hops and grapevines. Like I say, he put the brewers in contact with the folks he'd put in charge of this orc tribe's administration, which is something they now had, and promptly forgot all about it. The deal, that is. The orc tribe was an ongoing pet project of his that required occasional supervision and tampering. The brewers, however, were quick to capitalise on the offer and had now, independent of the PCs, established a label that was quickly gaining popularity locally. The next thing you need to know is that the party had long-standing contacts in the spice trade. Some of their earlier jobs had been security on merchant caravans and their travels had taken them to distant lands where often spices and other foods were produced. Being PCs, they were always looking for ways to make money and they quickly realised that spices often had very high value for their weight, could be easily separated into small amounts and so sold off or given as gifts or bribes in small quantities if necessary, unlike jewels, and had the obvious practical application of making food more palatable, particularly meat that gone a bit off. So they took to speculating on spices, 
This only became more true once bags of holding became involved. This behaviour was much more typical of the other party members than the necromancer, but it is nonetheless important. The last bit of background you need to know is that, as I believe I stated earlier, the necromancer made a point to learn as much as he could about the local cuisine, both common and, if possible, noble, whenever he went. So anyway, this necromancer comes back and restructures his cheese business and before too long, he's making good money. But that was never the goal. It wasn't enough to produce merely this cheese, he had to share it with the world. So he says he wanted to establish a base of operations. Now again, I figured he'd convert one of his forgotten tombs he'd recaptured into a base or build a tower like a normal wizard. Instead, he tells me he wants to open a high class tavern in the city. I asked him if he's sure and he replies that he is. The city is really the only place where he can be assured that there will be a proper audience for his cheeses. Once they catch on there, they can start selling them across the realm and beyond. That and the city is the one place that can provide a steady stream of bodies for his dissections and experiments without people getting too suspicious. The rogue chimes in that he wouldn't mind having another safe house in the city for his eventual thieves guild. More a band of spies and vigilantes actually. And it's settled. So the necromancer drops a huge amount of gold that he's been saving up on some prime real estate, makes some renovations and opens up his tavern. Now, this particular tavern was atypical in a few aspects. First of all, its focus was obviously cheese. Second, rather than being a place for travellers to stay that serves some drink and maybe some food, it was more like a modern restaurant slash caterer. It didn't have a full menu like a proper restaurant, but did have different offerings almost every day and specified dishes available by special order in advance. Obviously, a place with reputation for high quality, exotic and specialised provender will attract the wealthy, but since the necromancer wanted to make sure that common people could get a taste of Jesus, he divided the large common area into three main sections. The first offered basic, inexpensive fare, offered performers walk-in auditions and was open to anyone. The second required paid membership and was more private. The food offered here was more expensive and exotic and was of higher quality. It also offered more organised gambling options and booked only known professional performers. The third area was a feast hall that could be hired out for private parties and special occasions. When no such events were booked, it was either closed off or, on busy nights, opened up to expand one of either two areas. The other big difference between this tavern and others was that this one's cellar was staffed by desiccated skeletons and had a secret sub-basement that hosted weekly dissections of human bodies, attended by a cable of sinister men and women in dark robes. So there's that. So that's that. The Necromancer's Tavern was a huge success. He has since used it as the cornerstone of his whole business empire. It is an industry that spans the region with such diverse interests as farming, of grains, fruits, vegetables and meats, brewing and distilling. It offers food from across the known world and more recently beyond. It is intimately tied in with the ventures of the other party members, such as the rogues band of spies, information brokers, smugglers and doers of good deeds in the barbarians horse trading, smithing and mercenary concerns. It has in its time affected the lives fortune of men, halflings, orcs and most recently dwarves in a rather surprising fashion. It is an effort to bring the formerly unattainable to the common man. It's a front for a group of human ghouls whose society at large would find repulsive were they aware of them. Mostly though, it's about cheese. Sure, now the first thing you need to know is that all of the party members are moderately talented musicians. None of them are bards and none of them are superlative, but they can hold their own. The necromancer is probably the poorest musician, but he's a pretty gifted composer. Pick related is his favourite instrument. In the real world, it's a Tibetan instrument called a kangling, or femur trumpet. It's exactly what it looks like and sounds like. He's not that great at it compared to some other instruments, and it tends to sound kind of crummy at the best of times. But he loves the morbidity and transgression of the whole thing. And, more importantly, he likes to see human remains that would ordinarily just be wasted put to good use. A bit more relevant is the fact that the very first proficiency he took after anatomy Even before healing and herbalism, he traded most of his bonus languages for non-weapon proficiencies, was artistic ability. He uses it mainly in his study of anatomy. He mainly sketches and draws, 
but he can paint very well when he wants to, although he does so slowly. He is a good, but once again slow working, sculptor as well. That's technically supposed to be at least two proficiencies, but I let him have it for one. The rogue is a very accomplished poet and writer, and the barbarian has a fascination with, among other things, maps and exploration. They are a very intellectual party. Incidentally, he taught Marty to dance. Being a rat, he's not very good, but he's highly amusing. Anyway, a while back they realised that they've reached a pretty high level, which is to say that the character took some time in the freaking mansion, albeit a rundown crappy one that they rented from some nobles who never used it anyway, and thought about their lives. This quickly turned to scheming, as these things always do with this party. One of the necromancer's goals since the beginning has been to bring the world the benefit that the study of physical forms brings. Now, this is not easy, as his studies are illegal or at least heavily stigmatised throughout the world, on moral grounds in most civilised places and on superstitious grounds in uncivilised ones. Oddly, the only places he's been able to freely practise his craft has been in lands with civilised but cruel governments, and then only with state sponsorships. Unfortunately, he finds tyranny rather distasteful and chooses not to keep the job. Therefore, he is a part of a secret brotherhood of like-minded scholars, some of them wizards, some not, who make it their mission to aid one another in the study of knowledge that is forbidden, specifically the way creatures are put together, how they work, what separates things that are alive from things that are dead, etc. One of his particular areas of interest is spreading knowledge of anatomy to those who produce works of art so that they can decide whether they want to incorporate that knowledge into their work. He doesn't have any particular desire to impose his style on anyone, and he certainly doesn't seek fame, but he thinks that the best possible techniques and knowledge should be available to the greatest number of people, so that they can do what they will to the fullest extent. He also has no qualms about sharing his views on artists whom he does not respect. As you may imagine, these two qualities are not entirely compatible. His honesty has done little to earn him respect and friendship in the art world. It does not help that he is, once again, a fucking creep. Since very low levels, ever since he got the altar self-spell, Chain self was forbidden to necromancers back then, as I recall. When in large cities, where professional artists can gain patronage, he has used his magic to assume the identity of a flamboyant artiste whose name is an anagram of his own name which might have been a tip-off if anyone had known who he was back then. He began conning a prominent courtier, the equivalent of a modern art critic. Now, back when necromancers couldn't cast charm person, nor indeed any enchantment slash charm spell, so had to do it the old-fashioned way. He bribed his way in to see the guy bearing art that he personally despised, but was specifically formulated to appeal the man's sensibilities. Very safe pedestrian stuff but very well made. As I recall, he may have hired a forager to create a letter of reference to. It ended up not mattering though, despite the fact that the necromancer was a terrible actor, the character, not the player. The courtier failed every single check to see through the deception. Through sheer luck and balls, the necromancer's plan has succeeded. I ruled that the courtier was simply too proud to admit that he had never heard of this clearly accomplished artist. He could never confess that there was anything about the art world that he did not know. Soon, the artist was introduced among the salons as a renowned painter from a neighbouring duchy and his art displayed at the highest of fashion. No one else was willing to admit that they hadn't heard of the fellow either. That would have made them look highly unfashionable. His bizarre behaviour, from his innate weirdness and poor acting ability, was written off as the eccentricity of a temperamental genius. In time, the artist's reputation became genuine. At first, he created art that was highly consumable, but gradually began to alter his style so that it was in line with his true sensibilities, and his style began to catch on. Notably, he gained renown and, more importantly, influence in the artistic circles, and he happily passed along his techniques and sketches, only to periodically disappear for long stretches, no doubt to study and practice his trade in some other prestigious endeavours. In reality, of course, he was doing battles with cultists and ghouls and forsaken ruins and planning out how he might better acquire cheese to feed his stinking, filth-encrusted rodent friend. But no one needed to know that. He had found a way to exert the influence he needed without having to endure fame or popularity. 
As I have indicated previously, he had adventures all over the known world, and aside from learning all that he could about local cooking practices, he learned and recorded information about the arts and music practiced by various nations. In time, he had contacts throughout most of the lands he travelled. Which brings us back to that broken down, drafty, leaky mansion. He was always eager to move on to a new scheme or project and he hit upon the idea to begin a sort of artistics collective. He began to compose letters to the various contacts he had made over the years, inviting them to come or else send an apprentice or journeyman to be put in the mansion. The idea being that they would come together and pull their artistic skills and knowledge. They would share what they knew, take what they pleased and come away richer for the experience. Well, it wasn't long before the rogue got wind of this and smelled an opportunity. Why should they stop there? The necromancer was always saying that he wanted to spread knowledge and empower people. Why should this process be limited to artistic endeavours? Why should they not do the same with medicine, navigation, natural philosophy, alchemy and all other such studies? Perhaps even skill at arms and the practice of magic. What they needed, the rogue said, was not a collective, but a university. Well, the idea caught on with a grip. The necromancer was reluctant at first. The whole idea of a university seemed awfully hierarchical. <laughs> I can't fucking say it. Like, that's what you get, all right? We've done the hierarchical and times. I can't, can't say it. I think we might have done this but like 40 times. Right, that's I'm going insane. Sorry, guys. Continue on. And restrictive. And he wasn't at all sure he liked the sound of it. In time, however, the others were able to talk him into it. The barbarian in particular took a liking to the idea. He had a number of interests. He wanted above all to breed the finest horses in the world he had ever seen. He wished to live free and travel far afield, but he was also an excellent smith, having learned, among other techniques, the secret arts of the old empires that lay to the south of his homeland, and had long ago fallen into decline. In his youth, he had worked as a mercenary there, and it was there that he had learned to read, one of his most cherished skills. A barbarian that can read, that's pretty... Yeah, not- Beyond that, though, he wished for his name to live long and gloriously. And he saw this university as an opportunity to do just that. It would be the group's greatest achievement to date. One that might touch the lives of countless people. Perhaps alter society in itself. If they were to form a university, it would be the finest, grandest institution the world had ever known. Dude doesn't half-ass things is what I'm getting at here. As I mentioned, the barbarian was a fine smith, but that was not sufficient for him. In his travels, he had encountered creatures that were unharmed by ordinary steel, whose blood melted normal weapons as though they were butter. Even creatures that ate metal as a man would a loaf of bread. He required greater art. He desired the craft that, so far as he knew, only the elves and dwarves possessed. He desired the knowledge of how to forge mithril and adamant. Some years earlier, he had given some items of minor magic to an Archean, or, if you prefer, Mercane, who had happened the Necromancer's Tavern. In exchange, the mysterious creature had told him of someone who had someone who might teach him what he wanted to know. A rogue smith of the race of southern dwarves. He lived on the greater plains of the southeast, one of the parts of the world to which none of the party members had ever ventured. Up to this point, he had never had sufficient cause to venture to that region. He had, however, taken measures to ensure that, when he did seek out the dwarf, he would be prepared to convince him to teach him. The Arcane had told him that this eccentric dwarf had a number of unusual interests, among them exotic meats. The barbarian took immediate notice of this particular attribute. He was a skilled tracker and hunter, and often encountered fearsome but potentially edible beasts in his adventures. So it was that during an expedition to the mysterious dark lands of the southern archipelagos, said to be the origin point of all necromantic magic, I'll probably run a campaign there one day, but for this party it was just a visit, the barbarian encountered an enormous boar, by far the largest he had ever seen. He was forced to slay the boar, but prolonged the group's stay on the strange, undead infested island for the express purpose of tracking down more. In this, he eventually succeeded and, despite all difficulty, managed to transport a number of young giant pigs back to the mainland, where he and the necromancer turned them over to the orcs I mentioned, with instructions to try and breed them with more reliably edible local varieties of swine, which they did successfully. That sounded like a fucking poem. Anyway, the university. 
with visions of the beginning of a new new era fresh in his mind. The rogue sprang into action. He knew that, wealthy though the party may be, they did not have the sort of funds that would be necessary to fund the sort of undertaking they had in mind outright, and in any event, they would need to secure the blessing of the local powers if the project were to succeed. He began calling in favours, wailing and dealing, bribing, cajoling and subtle threatening. He managed to convince the bulk of the nobles, the ruling council of the city, representatives of most of the major religions, and even some guilds that it would be in their best interest to support the founding of the university. In fact, he managed to convince them to invest heavily. All the while, careful not to secure the autonomy of the university and not let any party get too much control. In time, the party was summoned before the city's ruling council and given a mission. Before they would be allowed to break ground, they must first go forth and secure foreign applicants to teach and study. They were a bit mystified as to why exactly the ruling council would insist that this place of learning benefit foreigners, but ultimately didn't particularly care, as it was what they wanted to do anyway, and this was why they would get paid. One of the first places they went was recently reclaimed dwarf hold in the north. With some great role playing and a bit of luck, they actually managed to gain admission and convince the lord of the clan to lend a small amount of support. They also learned the dwarves had access to both mithril and adamant. The party soon continued their travels, which took them many places they'd never been. In the process, they decided to split the party, partly to improve their efficiency and partly out of game reasons, which actually turned out to be a lot of fun. The barbarian's adventure took him, among other places, to the greatest dwarf hold in the south. It was here that the barbarian began to hatch a plan. He saw that there was much that the dwarfs of the north and south could offer one another, but he also saw that relations between them were strained. They had no meaningful contact that anyone could possibly recall, and there were a number of old wounds and resentments that, being dwarves, they had no desire to let go. So he began to plot. First he managed to convince them to send a delegation. There was a particular influential dwarf counsellor, who was very keen to get in on the ground floor of this university business, for he saw great opportunities for his people, even if most of them did not. Second, He managed to get them to agree and send an architect along with the delegation, the intention being that he would do the bulk of the design of the university building. Having been to the dwarf hold, the barbarian had come to the conclusion that the dwarves were the finest architects in the world. After stopping in the dwarf hold, the barbarian managed to track down the rogue smith. The fellow turned out to be rather hostile to visitors, but the barbarian managed to talk him into letting him in. After a bit of conversation, the barbarian managed to talk to the smith into giving him a chance. He used some magic he had been given to contact the necromancer, who teleported one of the hybrid hogs to the smith's dwelling. In the intervening time, the necromancer had taken the time to research dwarven cuisine and had managed to put together a recipe designed to be the finest meal a dwarf could ask for. Developing the recipe, he rolled a critical success, and he rolled another critical success when it came time to prepare the meal. The dwarf was extremely impressed, to say the least. He agreed to teach the barbarian on the spot. The barbarian stayed and learned the secrets of crafting the magical metals. When it came time to return to the city, the barbarian met up with the others. Together they plotted what they would do when the dwarves came. They resolved to put on a great feast in their guests' honour. When the day came, the party put the visiting dwarfs up in their now-restored mansion after giving them some time to recover from their journey and become accustomed to their surroundings. The party held the feast. Instead of inviting local dignitaries as the dwarves had expected, though they invited a delegation of northern dwarves, (laughs) me, (laughs) when the guests arrived, things were a bit awkward. The two parties of dwarves weren't sure what to say to each other. They didn't even know where to begin. That's when the necromancer brought forth the centerpiece of the feast, A team of servants wheeled out a pair of great hybrid boars that he had cooked according to his secret recipe. Against all odds, he had rolled yet another critical success, and the smell of that hog flesh filled the hall. Then the necromancer himself emerged, brandishing his gleaming, wickedly sharp knives, deftly carved the great beasts before the eyes of the shocked guests. He called upon every ounce of the skill his years of butchering, and live vasection had given him, separating meat into neat slices with flourish that left the onlookers speechless. 
but if they were stunned by the spectacle of the carving. They, in total awe of the meal, every dish had been specifically designed to complement every other and to stimulate the dwarven palate. A group of well-mannered humans might have taken the time to savour the sublime feast, but the hungry dwarves tore into the feast with abandon. Naturally, in the process, they consumed copious quantities of a heavy brew that the necromancer had acquired, which was likely based on a dwarvish recipe. Midway through the meal, the barbarian stood up and bellowed for everyone's attention. It was only then, once those in attendance were enjoying the sumptuous meal and were beginning to feel the effect of the strong drink, that he formally welcomed everyone to the feast. He said that they were all welcome under this roof and bade them to take some time and celebrate the occasion of their having been brought together. He told them that they were from lands far distant from one another and their cultures were far divergent. They were all brothers in spirit, for they all carved the stone of the same earth. With that, took a bite of a great hunk of meat and swallowed a huge gulp of beer. A cheer rose up from the assembled dwarves and soon they were singing dwarf songs both old and new. There were some repairs that were needed to the hall after that feast, but it was a small price to pay. The two dwarf cultures opened up formal diplomatic relations. The southern dwarves agreed to supply a master architect to design the buildings for the university and the northern dwarves agreed to help provide stone and master masons to supervise the workmen. The lord of the northern dwarf hold, the party had visited, offered to grant the party a boon. The barbarian asked to be given permission to buy mithril and adamant from the dwarves. His request was granted. He is currently trying to decide what to make. Hey guys, do you like models in your tabletop role playing games? Because we do too. Do you like having big bitty waifus on your table? Because we do too. <laughs> <laughs> we got human bitties. We got lizard bitties. We got orc bitties. Oni bitties. Cat bussies. We've got everything you want at neckbeardia.co.uk. <laughs> Check the links down below. It helps us out a lot. Sorry for interrupting the video. Let's get on with the story. Okay, prior to meeting up with the rogue and the barbarian, the necromancer had a bunch of solo adventures and travelled for maybe a year or two with a full party. But he also had a habit of teaming up with psychotic fighters. Both were played by the same player. He's the closest we have to that guy. He's our friend and a good guy, but he has a habit of, especially back then, of playing weird, psychopathic, action slash slasher movie, power and revenge fantasy characters. We didn't mind too much. It was kind of annoying and honestly it did, and does. He still plays with us, though not in this game kind of detract from the game, but he has a good time. The first one was a pretty overtly evil bastard sword-wielding fighter of a custom monster race that he made up was half skeleton and half really buffy guy. Don't think too badly of him. We were kids, and even though we thought it was pretty dumb, we enjoyed hanging out with him and that was what he really really wanted to play, so we figured why the hell not. We had some adventures with him and eventually phased him out when the player moved away for a while. When he later moved back, he decided to create a new character, another fighter. This one though was an elf who had exceptional strength. All his characters have really high stats. When we play a system with rolled or otherwise randomised stats, which is suspicious but again not disruptive enough to seriously get in the way of our fun, so we let it slide. Who used, of all things, a pair of hand axes. I always thought that it must look kind of silly to see this big muscle man elf hacking away at his enemies with a pair of hatchets like a damn praying mantis or something. But the player was happy, so we were too. Back then this player had an attraction to the chaotic good alignment. I'm pretty sure because he felt that it would allow him to claim to be one of the good guys, while in reality doing whatever the hell he wanted. I asked if he was sure he wanted to play a good character, and not a neutral or evil one. The necromancer didn't give a damn about alignments, and we didn't care about them all that much, either. We always just saw them as a sort of jumping off point for characterization, but he insisted that he wanted to be chaotic good, so who were we to countermand him? So he rolled up the character and, sure enough, he did make an effort to generally try to do good and not be quite as much of a murderous psycho. He certainly fit in better than the literal monsters, which opened up a lot more role playing opportunities to say the least. In order to give his elf an excuse to hang out with this creepy necromancer and probably in an attempt to justify the character's brutality, but mostly just because he was into things that were dark and edgy. 
He gave himself a backstory that involved his elf clan, or whatever it is elves have, being slaughtered and his character being left by the attackers to die. I was fine with this and the next time the necromancer went through the forest, I took the opportunity to have him happen upon a buried remnants of an elf village. Naturally, he immediately began to search for it for loot and examine bodies, both to see how they died and to determine whether any of them were worth dissecting. When he happened upon a severely wounded survivor, more or less on a whim, he decided to nurse him back to health and a new partnership was formed. When he awoke, the elf described the destruction of his village with a great relish and sore revenge on the perpetrators. An oath that, strangely, he never followed up on and seemed to forget about within a few sessions, despite occasional breadcrumbs I left. The necromancer very quickly picked up that this elf might not be entirely stable and came up with the idea for an experiment. Elves are, of course, known for their commitment to their ideals, but this one was full of anger and thoughts of sweet revenge. He wondered how much urging it would take to get him to abandon his principles altogether. As I said at first, the elf did an alright job of representing himself as a good-hearted. He helped those in need, fought those who would oppress and harm others, all that business. He did always have a bit of a temper problem and tended to go overboard when things eventually came to violence. But for all that, he seemed to genuinely mean well. As time went on though, he, with a little help from the necromancer, always subtly, always in character, became a worse and worse person. His acts of charity gradually became bizarre pageants of self-aggrandizement. Towards the end, he had all of his coins converted to platinum and made a point of leaving ludicrous tips for everything, insisting that he was doing it to help workers rather than for the attention it brought. The retribution he delivered upon the wicked became increasingly brutal, and the standard for what constituted wickedness became progressively lower. He began torturing prisoners, at first for information but later simply because he could. He increasingly used his drive for vengeance, not vengeance on those who destroyed his village, as I said, he'd forgotten all about them, just vengeance on the world in general, apparently, to justify increasingly extreme behaviour, most especially ever escalating acts of violence. He became more and more self-important, always demanding that proper respect to be paid to him and, as in everything, his notion of what constituted disrespect kept changing. All this took place over maybe two years or so real time. I'd actually say it was a brilliant piece of role playing, depicting a flawed man's gradual slide to depravity, had the player been aware of it. Anyway, at some point the necromancer took studying intelligence. His studies eventually led him to hypothesise that, through a combination of surgery and the application of magic, he could increase a creature's intelligence. He began experimenting with mixed results. They had an awful lot of squirrel stew during that time. Eventually though, he developed a process that could somewhat reliably increase the intelligence of those who survived the process. It was good enough for him and he decided to move on to the next phase of testing, applying the process to a thinking being. He was bright enough to realise that humans were probably out of the question. No one was likely to volunteer for an unnecessary surgical procedure that might very well kill them. Even in a big city, people going missing might eventually be noticed, say by the Beggars Guild, and that was amongst the last grips he wanted on his ass. Also, what was he to do in the event that he was successful? He couldn't very well let the subject go. Even wearing a mask could be no sure protection. Even if he wore it at all times, the subjects might recognise his voice or some small detail for which he could not account, which could lead back to him. Slaves were an option, but for some reason I can't recall why he decided against it. It was looking like the next phase of his tests might be difficult to conduct, but then he realised that no one gives a damn what happens to orcs. He travelled for a bit, listening for rumours about a suitably remote settlement that was suffering from persistent orc or goblin attacks and eventually found an acceptable location. He came to town, learned what he could do about the orcs, quietly raided the local graveyard for fresh minions, and set off on his way. Travelling during the day, when orcs were least likely to be awake and alert, the fighter and necromancer managed to locate an entrance to the orcs' warren, which was located in a system of caves. They set up a secret camp not far from the entrance, careful to hide their scent from any wargs. The orcs actually put up a pretty good fight, but the necromancer's magic proved to be a fairly unsurmountable advantage. Due to good luck and the clever application magic and tactics, they were actually able to capture a pretty substantial number of orcs. 
It was the old orc prisoner dilemma, but this time the party encountered it on purpose. The necromancer immediately set about seeing how resilient the orc's culture was. It turns out that they do not take to conquest well. In fact, they seem to violently resist all attempts at pacification. In time, however, they hit upon something that they responded to. The elf's thoughtless brutality. So the fighter starts oppressing the orcs. But it turns out the methods he chooses to use turn out to be weirdly in tune with the existing orc culture. He rules mostly through sheer physical intimidation, backs it up with a sort of macho ethic. At all times, he sought to assert his dominance over those around him, and he did not hesitate to use violence to back up his claims to supremacy. The orcs could respect that, even as they hated him for his elfish blood and what he had done to them and their people. When an orc challenged his authority, he might fight him in personal combat and thoroughly humiliate him before sending him off to the wizard for torture, assuming he survived, of course. He was often pointlessly cruel, at times tormenting his lessers simply because they were weaker than him, which, again, the orcs respected as a sign of strength and good leadership. When he was pleased, though, he could be unreasonably generous, which didn't hurt matters. I won't bother to detail the various things he did, but suffice to say, by this point he had become something of a monster, and fit in right. Another trait that the fighter possessed, which I have neglected to mention up until now, has been his fierce loyalty to the necromancer. For whatever reason, the fighter considered the necromancer his best and only friend, and basically did everything he said without question. The feeling was not mutual. The clearly strong leader's almost slavish loyalty to the sinister figure, who could command the dead, only served to reinforce the fear the orcs felt for the necromancer, who used his standing as a figure of supernatural dead to influence the orc culture further still. Once the orcs were relatively pacified, the necromancer made his purpose known. He selected a number of candidates and proclaimed that they had been chosen to undergo a trial. It would be a dangerous and painful ordeal, but those who were able to endure and who pleased the gods, which is to say were lucky, would be imbued with greatness. Naturally, the orcs as a whole gladly agreed to the necromancer's bargain, because orcs, as a whole, aren't afraid of painful ordeals and greatness sounded like a pretty good thing to have. Also, they were afraid of what might happen if they refused the necromancer's edict. As with the squirrels, the results of this experiment were mixed. Unlike the squirrels, he wouldn't let the orcs eat any of the failed test subjects. He didn't approve of cannibalism in humanoids, considering it as an unhealthy habit that could only spread disease. So he just animated their corpses so that they could continue to serve the tribe. Those who survived, however, did frequently display increased intelligence. The necromancer was pleased with his outcome, but still had other experiments in mind. The best people to try it on is orcs, because orcs are fucking stupid anyway. <laughs> Well, it depends on the set. If orcs are Most part. orcs are fucking stupid. Yeah. The necromancer realised that the state of affairs as it was could not last forever. It was likely only a matter of time before things came to a head one way or another, which would likely result in the death of either he and the fighter, or most of all the remaining orcs, neither of which was a desirable outcome. So he concocted a new approach. Having collectively traumatised the orc population through his acts of subjugation and torture, not to mention his actual supernatural powers and command over both the fear and hated elf who now ruled them and the dead themselves. The necromancer had begun to take on mythic proportions in the minds of the orcs. Being a mythic figure gave him great power over the damaged culture. He began to be perceived as a figure rather like the devil, or perhaps a servant of the gods, who are rather like the devil the orcs anyway, sent to test them and make them stronger. He also had an idea for a new experiment, one that was intended to test the efficiency of the upgrades he had performed and simultaneously see just what sort of acts orcs could be made to perform that were antithetical to their ordinary behaviour. So it was that when he began making pronouncements, the orcs listened. First, he announced that he and the fighter would soon be leaving, but that they would return in time. He told them that, while it would be possible for them to flee, doing so would lead to their destruction. He was quite serious about this. He took the liberty of securing bits of hair and such from the surviving orcs for use in scrying. He proclaimed that there were certain commandments that the orcs were to follow in his absence. Failure to do so would lead to severe punishment. They were to cease all raiding activity on humans and demi-humans. They were to approach the nearby village peacefully 
and, regardless of their reaction, become their friends, his word. And once their friendship had been established, they were to learn from the humans the arts of farming and begin cultivating the surrounding land. This would be their new primary source of livelihood. Obviously, he had his doubts that the orcs would follow through on these directions. But to stay and make sure would contaminate the experiment, not to mention put him and the fighter at risk. The orcs were bound to figure out that they weren't as invincible as they seemed. So he decided to try and find a way to bow out gracefully. Before he could leave though, he needed to make sure the orcs had a stable leadership structure. First he set about making a magic item. He ordered the orcs to forge a crown. It ended up not being a crown so much as one of those horned helmets. One of the finest quality. Or the finest quality orcs can manage anyway. When it was complete, he set about imbuing it with magic. He figured out a way to enchant one of the horns with a low-powered version continual light and the other with a low-powered version of continual darkness. The two kind of cancelled each other out, so the actual level of illumination in the room the thing was in wasn't affected all that much. The thing's only real magical property was to look pretty cool. It was a phenomenally crappy magic item, but it did the job. The orcs were impressed. Next, he announced a series of trials that were designed to test the participants physically, mentally, and allegedly, spiritually. They amounted to some problem-solving tests, some feats of strength and other tests of fitness, and mock combat. The necromancer had favourites, but did his best not to interfere with the trials. He didn't use his buffs to help his favoured competitors win, for example, as again, that would have contaminated the experiment. It turned out he didn't need to anyway because one of his successful subjects won the whole business. Anyway, so that was that. A new orc king was coronated. The tribe was warned one last time to do as they have been told, and the duo left the caves, leaving their skeletons and zombies with them. Due to unforeseen adventures, it would be a couple of years before he would return. By this time, the necromancer had fallen in with his current companions, the rogue and the barbarian I've mentioned before. They'd spent maybe a year or so, perhaps less, adventuring together by this point. They had formed deep bonds of friendship during their travels and travails. But the necromancer was understandably worried that they would not fully appreciate the value of his experiment. Which is to say that they might deem him mad or monstrous and turn on him. So he concocted an odd tale about having heard rumours of an orc farm which was sort of true, he had heard a rumour about an entirely unrelated tribe of farming orcs and insisted they go to investigate. The barbarian and most especially the rogue were understandably suspicious as they were not idiots and furthermore knew by this time that the necromancer had numerous secrets and schemes wherever they went. But they went along with it anyway. They embarked on a journey to a certain remote village, each in his way wondering what they would find. Right away, they could tell that something wasn't quite right. As they approached the outskirts of the village, they saw that the land appeared to have been erratically turned as by some mad team of plowmen. The earth was dust and dry in some places and swampy in others. Sickly plants grew here and there and more rarely, healthy ones could be seen. Closer into the town, they found things were a bit more orderly and the crops more successful. But the plants seemed stressed, and the people they saw looked weary and downcast. They decided against bothering any of the workers before they got to the town proper. Upon reaching the town, they noticed that there were orcs going about in daylight. At first, they couldn't tell they were orcs, for they wore large hats that covered their faces or else less commonly hoods. They decided not to bother any of those surely upstanding citizens. Instead, they made their way to the local tavern and set about learning what they could about the bizarre little town. The necromancer naturally kept his face hidden. His companions did not particularly take note of this, as it was relatively common practice for him to do so. The townsfolk were reluctant to speak to the adventurers, at first insisting that nothing was wrong. When they managed to get one of them somewhere more private, however, he glanced around nervously before recalling the story. He told them that the town long had troubles with the Yorks that lived in the hills having to endure occasional raids and attacks on the road, but it seemed that a couple of years back, weird things had started happening. A raiding party of orcs had tried to storm the town gates once, making a great racket while doing so. Naturally, they had driven them off with arrow fire. They had thought that would be the end of it, but the next day, they had seen the raiders approach again, this time in broad daylight, even when they began firing at them. 
the orcs continued approaching, shouting as they did so. It took a bit of doing to drive them off at that time, but they kept at it and eventually managed to get rid of them. A couple of days later, a single orc approached bearing an enormous shield, which made him frustratingly difficult to kill. When he got close, they could hear him shouting about peace and wanting to be friends. They looked around, but did not see any other orcs. They took some time and debated what to do. While they did so, then the men on the walls reported that the orc had thrown something at them. They had returned fire, but had not managed to kill the orc. A bit of searching revealed a strange stone, which on closer inspection revealed to be a semi-precious gem. They weren't sure what was going on, but they knew that they didn't much like it. They weren't sure what this orc's game was, but they weren't about to let it sucker them. They dispatched militiamen armed with simple spears to go kill the orc, which they did. Bizarrely, the orc was unarmed, though an inspection of the body revealed that it was carrying a number of small semi-precious gems and a fair amount of coinage. These spoils were distributed to the men of the militia as fairly as possible, and they redoubled their vigilance. That was the last they saw of the orcs for a bit. A couple of weeks passed with no orc sighting and things slowly went back to normal. For days, folks talked about the strange events and what they might pretend. A few who had heard of what happened said that it didn't seem right for them just to kill the unarmed orc like that. But those who'd lost close family and friends to orc raids were quick to point out that orcs had no such qualms about killing unarmed humans and that it was a bit better to have a dead orc in a safe town that was a bit richer than let an orc in and risk everyone's safety. In time, the talk died down and folks went back to their lives as usual. They had driven off the orcs and would do so again if they returned, as they always had. When the attack came though, they found that they weren't as well prepared as they had thought. No one was quite sure how they'd come up on them so quick without anyone noticing. Usually they came up screaming and bellowing and swinging their weapons, killing whomever they could, but not pursuing those who managed to get away very far. They only rarely came near the town proper, for they knew that the town had walls and archers and there wasn't all that much to be gained. They'd heard that in the north, where orcs were more plentiful, they periodically poured out of the mountains in a great horde and destroyed everything in their wake. They'd heard that at such times they often used surprisingly sophisticated techniques, but they never thought that such a thing could happen here. The orcs hereabouts were simple raiders. That night though, everything was different. The orcs had come in greater numbers, employed more advanced tactics than the townsfolk had thought them capable of. Even deployment of such simple technology as ladders took them totally by surprise. They knew that orcs could forge weaponry, but somehow they had always fancied that they spent all of their time when they weren't terrorising humans, squatting in caves doing nothing of any particular use. The idea that they might be able to outthink them had never entered their minds. It was horrible. The orcs poured into the village, killing some and catching others in great nets. They were strong and fast and savage and nothing could stop them. Worst of all though, was their leader. He was a great orc, powerful and clad in heavy armour. On his head he wore a helmet of shining darkness. He struck down all who stood against him with his mighty strength and commanded the orcs with speed and confidence, instantly responding to whatever desperate defence they tried to mount. Soon, everyone in the town had either fled or been captured or killed. They were sure that they would all be killed or eaten or something somehow worse. For hours they were held captive, herded into the largest buildings in the town. They were told, in common, which a month ago they had no notion orcs could speak, to be silent until they were told otherwise. They were examined and counted. Orcs could count, but not harmed. In that time, there were a few attempts to escape, which were uniformly dealt with harshly, though usually not lethally. They were kept together, what purpose no one knew, for what felt like forever. At last, though, they were all forced out into the centre of town. The terrifying king of the orcs came before them and calmly addressed the assembled townsfolk. He told them that he regretted that this conquest had been necessary, but he had been left with no choice. It had been decided that man and orc would be friends and he would not tolerate any other outcome. Three times he had sent his envoys of friendship, and three times they had been met with violence. He would tolerate no more. He would have friendship at any price. <laughs> Me trying to make friendships. <laughs> Be my friend now! <laughs> he forbid the town folk to try and leave the town, to ensure that the more fragile humans were not damaged in escape attempts. 
women and children would be held for their own protection in the underground cellars that the orcs would shortly begin constructing. Those that had already fled would be dealt with and returned if possible. In subsequent days, he announced that he and many of the occupying orcs would be returning to their home, but that a permanent force, a friendship force, (laughs) would be established to administer things in the town. The new friends would be taught the arts of farm craft. Naturally, the townsfolk would have to supply the farming axes and earth swords, and whatever else it was that was required to do farming, until such a time as new ones could be crafted. Naturally, they would be fairly compensated for this loss. In time, the number of orcs in town was reduced, just as the king had said, but the friendship force had occupied the town ever since. They had turned out to be rather poor farmers. They spoiled the land over tilling by the soil, or improperly irrigating. They had very little patience, often accusing the farmers of trying to trick them when the immediate results were not yielded, and often undertook unwise actions when frustrated. Initially, some of them seemed to be under the impression that farming was a matter of beating the earth until it yielded up its spoils. One was heard to remark, What's wrong? I'm hitting it as hard as I can! Looks like meat's back on the the menu, menu, boys! (laughs) The compensation for the farming equipment and seed and livestock necessary to get the orcs started on their venture, and for the food necessary to keep the occupying orcs fed, which the king was kind enough to offer when it became clear that the farming was going to take longer and yield less than had been anticipated, was largely worthless. It was either precious stones or metals that they couldn't spend because they could no longer go to the market in a city old orcish artifacts that were of little value even if they could be sold, and things that were actively harmful, like live wolves to protect the farmer's livestock. The only thing of any value that the orcs provided were regular shipments of food and lumber, both harvested from the forest hills near the orcs' warren. Even these, though, were mostly taken up by the orcs' own need. The man the party interviewed had little insight into what had led the orcs on this sudden, mad course. He knew that the king had commanded them to do so, but they all acted like it was some sort of desperate mission rather than the pure insanity that it obviously was. He gathered that it was part of their dark, orky religion, for they often talked about secret happenings and hushed tones in their own language. But what god could have led them to such madness he didn't dare imagine? Now though, a group of adventurers had arrived and surely their troubles would be soon over, for as everyone knew, There was nothing that adventurers liked to do so much as save beleaguering towns from marauding orcs. He could scarcely contain his excitement at the prospect that the long nightmare was finally over. Fortunately, the rogue managed to calm him down and get him to keep his mouth shut for the time being, lest he endanger the mission. The barbarian and rogue were confused to say the least. They couldn't imagine what could possibly be going on, but they, particularly the rogue, knew that the necromancer was somehow involved. The necromancer, for his part, said nothing, though he did a piss poor job of hiding that something was on his mind. The group didn't really have anywhere they felt comfortable talking about it for the fear of being lynched by all parties involved, so they simply resolved to find this orc worn in the hills when they had a chance, assuming they were allowed to leave the town. It turned out not to be all that difficult to get out of the town, have little to lose because, hey, It wasn't their loved ones who was being held hostage. They managed to create a suitable distraction and simply quietly left the town when the resident orcs weren't looking. The barbarians set about searching for signs of the passage of orcs to lead them to the orc stronghold, which turned out to be just a well since the necromancer had more or less forgotten how precisely to get there, and soon they were on their way. On the way, while the barbarian was searching for sign and for danger, the rogue began needling the necromancer. He mentioned that all this was a rather strange situation. The necromancer conceded that it wasn't quite what he had anticipated either. The rogue continued that it was rather miraculous that the necromancer had happened to hear that there were farming orcs in this area, considering that they had no contact with the outside world. To which the necromancer responded that he actually travelled to this area once in the past, and, pray tell, had compelled him to return on this particular occasion the rogue wandered. The necromancer responded, rather non-committedly, and with more than a bit of non-sequitur, that he had failed to anticipate this particular outcome. Presently the truth came out. The necromancer, slightly sheepishly, confessed his experiments to the rest of the party. The looks in the players' faces were priceless. (laughs) 
I can imagine. I know. In time, they arrived at the orc's lair, where they were greeted with great honours. The necromancer was hailed as the prophet, and his companions introduced themselves as the profiteers, which is a pretty apt description of them most of the time. While the necromancer received a status update from the orcs, the other party members were shown around the orcs' caves. They heard the story of how the prophet had descended upon the clan with his terrible elf hound. They were told of how he had brought with him the cutting times to test the endurance of the tribe and had chosen their king for greatness. They learned of the commandments of friendship and farming and how they had scrumptiously followed them in the prophet's absence. Lest he bring about a return to the cutting times, an event that the tribe might not survive a second time. The necromancer for his part learned that his surgery had indeed worked. The orcs who had shown signs of enhanced intellect had generally performed quite well, often rising to positions of leadership within their rest respective fields, or else advising those who had, so much so that it had become the fashion amongst the tribe to ritually scar the heads of young orcs as they came of age in hopes of imbuing them with greatness. But the increased intelligence of some had not spared the tribe its troubles. They still lacked the skills that the humans had won through the years, usually generations of work. They were still, one the whole, cruel and foul-tempered. They did not generally respect the conquered humans, though it quickly became clear that the king had a kind of respect for them, and so were often loath to heed in their advice. And though their mission may have been to master farming, they had no love of it. Even as they ploughed and planted and watered, they could not but yearn for the thrill of battle. He further learned that they had been very fortunate these past years in that no rival orc tribe had discovered the true extent of their weakened state. The king feared that, should their activities ever become clear to the other orcs who populated the hills, both orc and man might fall to their attacks. They spent a good bit of time amongst the orcs, learning their ways and teaching them where they could. They taught them advanced tactics and fighting techniques and began improving their defences in preparation for potential raids. The barbarian taught their smith ancient secrets of forging metal that had been imparted to him in distant lands. The necromancer began drawing up plans for magic items designed to improve the life of the orc and men. The rogue even explored the orc's religion and had a mystical experience deep within the caves. At last, they decided to see if they could find some way to somehow salvage this situation. They set out on a quest to locate someone who might help bring out the genuine peace between the two races and allow them to find some sort of happiness. The quest began in the nearest large town, where they purchased large amounts of food and other necessary items and had them sent up to the troubled village, with instructions to continue on their way as soon as possible. This town happened to have a temple to the goddess of agriculture. The group hadn't paid much attention to it when they'd passed through in the past, but it was now highly relevant to their interest. They entered the temple. Well, the rogue and the barbarian did. The necromancer stood outside across the street, sulking about and eating fruit he purchased from a local fruit vendor whose stall happened to be set up just there. And thanks to the rogue's charm and diplomatic ability, managed to secure an audience with the chief priestess. They asked, as directly as they could, whether there was anyone she knew of who might be able to help teach farming techniques to a band of orcs who had captured a human village in a misguided but earnest attempt to meet the frankly insane demands their crazed necromancer tormentor. Hypothetically, of course. She saw pretty quickly that they were probably not wholly innocent in this affair, but saw also that their desire to help was genuine, and so decided to tell them what they wanted to know. She informed them that they might find an individual who may be able to handle the scenario they had described in a tiny halfling village located some distance to the north. Well, they were able to get to the little halfling village with very little trouble. It was more or less what you'd imagine. Nice, gentle, rolling hills, suitable for halflings to build their burrows in. Fields of cute, fluffy sheep, minded by tiny shepherds with little crooks and gigantic, but friendly looking dogs giving away picturesque plots of crops and quaint little gardens strewn all about. Neat, straight fences and brightly painted doors, that sort of thing. They rode up, located what appeared to be a rather inviting tavern, or would have been if it had not have been built in miniature. 
and hitched their horses to a post that was entirely too low to the ground and find themselves greeted by a rotund, smiling little gentleman who introduced himself as the local sheriff. Patting the well taken care of, apparently seldom used, short sword that hung on his hip, they conversed with him for a bit. He welcomed them to the sleepy little town and asking if there was anything he could do to assist them. They complimented the fine, respectable community and eventually asking after the location of the man they sought. The sheriff cheerfully informed them that the fellow could be found from time to time tending the gardens around the shrine to the halfling gods that lay just up the road a ways. He said that he didn't suppose he would be there now, but if they cared to wait for a bit in the tavern, he would be there in due time. He even gave them a few coins for a drink. Now the rogue, ever suspicious and more familiar with halflings and their ways than he usually let on, decided to take a look at the coins that he had been given just in case the little folk were trying to put one over on them. Sure enough, they were marked on the edge in such a way that a casual observer wouldn't be likely to notice and wouldn't likely invalidate the coin with people who cared about such things. What it might mean though, he had no idea, so he decided to just go ahead and play along for the time being. The tavern was just the sort of pleasant little place that any respectable halfling farm would be happy to go in to put up his hairy feet and socialise with his fellows over a pipe of smokeweed and a pint of nice dark stout after a day of tending his plants. It was, of course, built entirely too small. Even the smallest of them, the rogue, had to hunch. And the barbarian and the necromancer, who was nearly as tall, felt as though they were bent almost double. The chairs were built so low that the men's knees were positioned halfway to their chests and their legs would not have fit under the tables even had that not been the case. It was highly pleasant for all though. A little investigation and asking of some canny questions presently revealed that there was more going on in this sleepy little hamlet than there had initially seemed. The rogue, experienced in subtle forms of communication, was able to convince the folk in the tavern that he and his comrades were worthy candidates to be let in on the goings on hereabouts, hinting that he already knew far more than he actually did. After some initial suspicion and nervous eyeing of the barbarian, and especially the necromancer, the rogue assured them that they were cool. The party was shortly directed to the back room, which had a concealed, though not so well concealed as it had once been. It had seen long and heavy use. Hatch in the door. They opened it and climbed down the ladder. It revealed, to their surprise, they discovered that there was what amounted to a second, larger tavern. This one, thankfully, had a higher ceiling, though the barbarian and wizard still had to mind the hanging lanterns. A lightly armoured halfling stopped them and offered to relieve them of their weapons, which they allowed, though the rogue kept most of his numerous hidden daggers. The tavern was more richly appointed than the one above, but remained tasteful. Everything smelled rather of pipe smoke, but it was tolerable. All about them were small tables. Some were similar to those above, albeit with different tablecloths, but others were clearly designed for the purpose of gambling. Few of them were in use. In the corner, in a sort of booth designed for privacy and guarded by some, relatively, burly halflings sat a rather obese and therefore successful halfling. One of the burly halflings confronted the party, but the large elderly halfling motioned for him to be silent. He asked them in an odd, mumbly, strangely accented voice what had brought them to his establishment. It soon became clear that they had stumbled upon the headquarters of an organised crime operation. This secret burrow served as a secondary tavern, safe house, gambling den and general hangout for members of this organisation as well as a shrine to the halfling god of, among other things, thievery. There was an odd sort of ceramic block with a halfling's footprint in it that they later saw visitors kneeling before and kissing. The rogue, sensing opportunity, began to talk up the party as potential assets to the organisation, always careful to show the utmost genuine respect and never to attempt to lie nor cheat in any important matters. Knowing that he would be found out, the grandfather, as they later learned he was called, was impressed with the kid's moxie and decided to offer him an opportunity to win his respect. They talked for a while and ultimately the rogue, unable to offer any more tangible proof of his worth at the moment, staked his reputation on a game of dice, which he proceeded to win straight. We actually played the game out and luck was on his side. It was an extremely dramatic and ballsy thing to do, 
but we were all on the edge of our seats when it came down to the final roll and let out a collective cheer when it came up a win. After receiving the grandfather's blessing, spirits were running high. The party enjoyed the room's goodwill and their congratulatory pints of stout, but they soon remembered why they had come to the town in the first place and headed back up to the shrine. There they found a lone, rugged halfling tending to the plants. They introduced themselves and inquired whether this fellow might be the man they sought. He regarded them with his one good eye. The other was covered by a dark eye patch and a rather ugly scar was visible peeking out from underneath it and replied that he was indeed the person that they had been seeking and what did they want. They explained the situation more or less completely to the halfling as he was bound to find out anyway and he conceded that they did seem to be in a bit of a pickle. There, but what did they want him to do about it? They returned that they had come highly recommended by the most reliable possible sources that they had happened upon in their entire week or so of searching, most of which was on the road between towns, as someone who could solve their problems for them. He in turn retorted that he was retired from that sort of business, and would they kindly buzz off. It was around that time that a pretty young human girl appeared, and asked what was going on. The halfling replied that it was nothing, just some kind of troublemakers, and he was just trying to get rid of them. So don't worry yourself about it. The girl was insistent, however as whatever it was they were talking about had sounded awfully important. The party agreed that it was their own business and that they would just have to find someone else to teach the orcs to farm. The girl, surprised, asked to know more. The halfling told her that it was a big folk business and nothing for them to get mixed up in. The girl, however, demanded that she be told about whatever it was that was going on, as she was now quite sure that it sounded important, adding that they knew all about farming. It was only a matter of time before the human girl, who was apparently the halfling's daughter somehow, was cheerfully telling the party that they'd be along presently. They just had to gather their things and say goodbye to everyone. They'd been living here for quite some time, so it might take a bit. The party, a bit confused but nonetheless grateful, wandered away from the shrine, wondered amongst themselves what had just happened. They decided they didn't care all that much and just headed back to the grandfather's den so they could eat, drink and gamble while they waited. Before too awfully long, the scarred halfling fellow came along and rather gruffly told them that it was time to go, so they'd better hurry up before he changed his mind about the whole business. On the journey back to the orc town, they discussed the situation and what was to be done about it. The halfling expressed worries that the whole business was probably pointless at this point, but granted that he supposed they had to at least give it a shot and could always bug out if worse came to worse adding that if anything should befall his daughter, he'd be coming for them. She, for her part, remained cheerfully, if cautiously, optimistic. When they arrived in the town's vicinity, they found it embroiled in an all-out battle, not between orcs and humans as they had feared, but between orcs, humans and enormous acid-spewing insect monsters, which the necromancer immediately identified as ankegs. He'd actually had occasions to dissect one or two in his previous adventure, back in his days with that adventuring company. The crew immediately joined the battle and proceeded to kick ass. The bulk of the fighting was naturally done by the party. The halfling fellow quickly revealed himself to be quite a competent, if rather underhanded, fighter. Even the girl held her own with her short sword. Once the battle was over, the orcs, not about to let good meat and chitin go to waste, proceeded to prepare the ank eggs for rendering. While the dazed humans struggled to come to terms with the surprising fact that the orcs seemed to have just saved their lives, the halfling, not one to sit idly by, apparently took charge of the situation, demanding that the humans quit lazing about and get back to work. What kind of farmer sits in his ass and lets other do all the labour? The humans, still rather stunned by the whole ordeal, did as they were told to help the butcher the slain monstrosities. Somewhat to the necromancer's chagrin, he wanted to do it. It wasn't long before the halfling had, with the party's help, more or less taken charge of the whole town. They were in a tough spot. In fact, it was pretty terrible. None of them had asked for this. But here they were. For better or for worse. Mostly worse. They were all in this together. And now there was nothing to do but buckle down and do what needed to be done. Because doing what needs to be doing was what farmers do. It was a message that everyone could relate to. If not necessarily fully embrace. And it got things on track. The halfling surveyed the fields to see what needed to be changed and determined what, if anything, could be salvaged. He met with the orc king and explained that, if this was going to work, he couldn't keep the humans working for him by force 
and managed to convince him to begin easing up on the restrictions that had been imposed upon the town folk. He also performed a survey of the hills that the orcs had cleared around their caves and found that there would be a good area for growing grapes and hops. Since then, the party has checked in on the little village a few times and find that things were running pretty smoothly. All things considered, tensions are still high, obviously, and they have a long and very difficult road ahead of them. But they have a few successes to their name. The orcs failed have become productive under the halfling's guidance. The orcs have proved better suited to growing grapes. It turns out orcs are good at picking and stomping things. And hops, which you literally just leave alone and pull down when it's time to harvest, than they were at the other crops, allowing the orcs who lived in the caves to get in on the agriculture game. They now have very promising prospects for the production of alcohol, though their wines still need to age a bit. Finally, they have been breeding a unique breed of unusually large hog that looks like it might have a lot of potential. The raising of the hogs does present considerable trouble and even danger, as they have proven to be highly aggressive. However, for whatever reason, the orcs have proven highly adept at managing the foul-tempered swine. All 